Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be your opening speaker. Right, let's cut straight to the point. Let's talk about the subject of this entire day, meaning. One way to discuss meaning is to consider its opposite. To think about what it's like to have a life not filled with meaning, but that seems meaningless. And that's where I want to start today, with a story about meaninglessness. Because I believe it underlines the importance of what you're doing here today. Late in the spring of 2016, I went on a reporting trip to South Wales. Perhaps you remember that time. Sat in number 10 was this guy called David Cameron. Remember him? He was one who said, Brits don't quit, and then quit. <laughs> Next door was his mate, George Osborne, who at that time still had only the one job. And the people in charge of the Remain campaign thought they had it in the bag. What convinced me they were wrong was an argument with a guy I, I met called Gareth Meek. Gareth was shaven-headed, he was barrel-chested, and he made it clear from the start that we weren't going to get on. And why should we? I was a journalist up from a posh paper in London. He was here in this small village called, and here I lack the requisite Welsh phlegm, Clan Hilleth. Now, Clan Hilleth is just a few rows of small houses over which towers this huge building, a kind of cathedral. This is the Mining Institute, a drinking hall come social club built by local miners out of their own money over 100 years ago. No government cash went into building this place. It relied on the prosperity and the pride of its community. Look at it. It says, we'll show the others. We'll have the best social club in the valleys. But if you go now, the windows have these stickers in Brussels blue because when the institute fell into dereliction and then shut, it was the EU that stepped in with public funds. And it's that building that Meek looks after. He'd worked in a factory until he got injured, and then he landed up here. Now think about that scene. A man who's come down in the world, in a building that's nearly died, in a part of the country where all the money's gone. Decline upon decline, upon decline. We get to talking about the upcoming referendum, the one you remember where Britain's all set to stay in. Except, like the vast majority of the people I'd met in this Labour stronghold of South Wales, Gareth doesn't care about what Jeremy Corbyn and the rest say. He's out. Why? Immigrants. Now, I kept hearing this, put in much worse language, all across that reporting trip. Except the thing about most of South Wales, there are no immigrants. The place you're most likely to find foreigners is inside the pages of the Daily Mail. So I say, you sound angry, and he is. But he's not really angry at immigrants or even at Brussels. No, what he's really furious at is the British government. Why? They sold the country out. There's nothing we own anymore. And while he talks, I'm remembering the drive out here, past abandoned buildings and hills that had once been black with coal dust, now turned to a lush and deindustrialized green. All right, Gareth, how's leaving the EU going to help? It won't make a lot of difference, but the damage is already done. You ain't going to pull it back now. And then he fixes me with this long, hard stare, and there's a big shrug of nihilism. So here is a man about to do something that he knows to be meaningless because his own life has been so sapped of meaning. And in this week, of all weeks, you don't need me to underline the consequences. Now think about Gareth's life for a moment, his home now pretty much hollowed out so that even the landscape speaks of the broken promises of the entire political elite. Where's the new businesses? Where's the workers? Where's the cash? He's stuck inside a museum to the better days of his community, which was decades ago. Think about his lack of voice. No politician speaks for him, 
No paper represents his lived experience. And just listen to how he talks about the economy as some extractive, inaccessible, far-off thing. It's not just Wales. I've met Gareth in Trump's America, in crisis hit Greece, in, crisis hit Greece, in Beppe Griot's Italy. I've even met versions of him in Mumbai, in India. But spread across Britain are people and places united by a common condition. They've been deemed surplus to requirements. They used to be productive, now they're supplicants depending on handouts. They used to have a say, now they live in mute resentment. The market discards them, the state disregards them. Until one day, it can't. Not any longer. All else being equal, the next time meaning have a conference, it will be after Britain's left Europe. And I think on a day like today, the phrase all else being equal has never really rung so hollow. But if Theresa May gets her way, she'll be haggling over our future relationship with the EU, a process that will take decades, could break many more ministerial careers. So we're stuck in a similar spot to the one our forefathers were in in the 1930s and 1970s, with capitalism failing us so badly, it now jeopardises the very functioning of democracy. We've reached a point where politicians are starting to take on board the protests of Gareth Meek and others. Even Theresa May talks about burning injustices. The question is, what does she and the rest of the political classes offer him instead? We already know. An hour and a half's drive from Gareth Meeks Institute is this place, an Amazon warehouse, as big as 10 football pitches. This is what counts for investment and job creation in Britain. For the honour of hosting two Amazon distribution centres in Fife and in Swansea, the governments of Scotland and Wales paid the company a combined total of £16 million. I say they paid, but actually you and I paid out of our taxes. We know what kind of jobs are on offer in these places, minimum wage, minimum rights, where workers are too scared to take toilet breaks where, to where workers are too scared to take toilet breaks, so they pee in bottles. We pay for our fellow citizens to be treated like human battery hens. We know too that Amazon is one of the richest companies on the planet, one of the richest companies in human history. Yet in some years, our government pays it more in grants than it gives in taxes to this country. But even while this government and others across Europe, is intent on slashing welfare for the working poor, it keeps splashing out on welfare for businesses in direct grants and subsidies and tax breaks. Much of this spending is deliberately obscured, but one academic at York University, a guy called Kevin Farnsworth, has spent the best part of a decade researching this stuff, ferreting through archives and putting in the freedom of information requests. By his conserved estimate, Britain spends £93 billion a year on corporate welfare. That's about twice the size of our entire education budget. Now, in a mixed capitalist economy, which is, say, pretty much every economy in the world, it's inevitable the state will support private enterprise. But in Britain, we do so in semi-secrecy and without demanding that businesses observe basic standards of fairness with workers, the environment, or even the public exchequer. Just look at the tax contributions. The big bar is the top five co-ops in the country, which includes such titans of industries, all and milk. The small bar is Amazon, Facebook, Apple, eBay, and Starbucks, some of the richest companies in the world. Look at that, look at that huge gulf, and then ask yourself, Who's more likely to get an audience in number 10? Mark Zuckerberg or the boss of Isla Milk? Who would Jacob Rees-Mogg describe as a wealth creator? Tim Cook of Apple or the chief executive of the cooperative group? As a society, as an economy, we reward those people who not only need no rewards, but who actively rip off the rest of us. Whether it's tax avoiders or train operators, in Britain, we are world beaters in paying other people to rip us off. 
So much for mainstream politics. But the progressive answers are often just as guilty of top-down thinking. Tax rich people, spend more, nationalise things. Much of this is necessary, but none of it is sufficient. Because how does any of that make the economy more accessible, more democratic to Gareth Meek or to you and me? As for the more radical solutions from either end of the political spectrum, well, they're often just sci-fi. How many times have you heard that robots are coming along and will change everything, that the future lies in automation and driverless cars? Well, look at this chart. This measures um, how far our economies are, uh, have got a density of robots per head of population. Right down the front, you can see Korea, Japan, Germany. Then you go right along to the other end of the scale, past Slovenia, past Slovakia, and there's Britain. Now, what that chart partly explains is why when you take your car for a wash, it's not a robot that does it, it's knackered migrant workers. It's also why Amazon doesn't need mechanised pickers, not when it can bus in humans with blistered feet for a fraction of the cost. I have two big takeaways from all of this. First, that holding out for a big new thing or a new set of ideas is intellectual escapism. Remember how Keynes said that in the long run we're all dead? Well, the present has a nasty habit of grinding on for a long time, so we'd best try and improve it now. Second, we should actively avoid solutions. Now, in these bleak times, I understand the hunger for them. But any ready-made, out-of-the-box solution, whether offered by a man in pinstripes or a woman in groovy trainers, is still being imposed from above. It still says, my meaning is superior to yours. We don't need answers. We need arguments. Our economy, our country, lacks an adult democracy in all its mess and noise and experimentation. What we have instead is a fake cynical democracy in which people who have never even changed a nap in their life pretend that they can represent people like Gareth Meek. And that's no surprise, really, because over the past 40 years, we've been told there is no alternative. And the people who told us that, like Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, made damn sure they bulldozed any institution that could incubate alternative ideas. Unions, councils, even the BBC, all now shadows of their former selves. So let's admit that there is no one big answer and go looking for the alternatives that are out there. That's what I chose to do this year for my paper, The Guardian, in a series called The Alternatives. I went looking for examples of bottom-up change, of people doing economics differently, and I found loads. One of my favourites is just up the road from here. This is the bevy. Any of you local? You should know this place, I guess. This is uh, the only um, cooperatively owned pub on a housing estate anywhere in Britain. And that's a guy called Jonathan. Um, now, without that pub, Jonathan would have nowhere to drink. But because it's more than a pub, he'd also have no community centre, no social hub, because when the private sector isn't bothered and the state is cutting back, it's the sort of people who brought the bevy back to life and keep it going now, who create civic institutions and keep communities from collapsing in on themselves. Here's the Granby Four Streets Community Land Trust in Liverpool, who brought their abandoned streets back to life and now develop social housing. This is Oldham, the poorest town in England, where the council's school dinner ladies feed their kids award-winning, locally sourced and organic meals, and they do it on razor-thin margins. Different people in different parts of the country doing different things with very different politics. Yet there are common threads. First of all, all of these people live in worlds that are thickly neighboured as Beatrice Pritchett once wrote of Rudyard Kipling's characters. They're not Thatcher's atomised individuals, nor are they Cameron's broken Britain. 
they care enough about their homes and their neighbours to try and make things better. Then there's values. This is Park Run, which organises community runs in parks for free for nearly a quarter of a million people every weekend. There's also Preston Council, which awards contracts to local businesses rather than multinationals. And what these projects have in common is they look at the way the market measures value and wave two fingers at it. They're about imbuing our economic lives with meaning. None of these ventures see a drop of that 93 billion quid. They get by on chicken feed, and they're small, as Boris Johnson pointed out at this autumn's Tory party conference. Here he is having a go at the pressing council and its guerrilla localism. Now, um, Boris, the uh, thinker politician, has a point. But the point about pressing council is however small, however tentative, it's only been going for a few years on this road, and so far it's been pretty effective. Here's a story that was published just a few weeks ago. Now, where Boris has got a point is that we haven't yet got to the point where the alternatives are mainstream, which is what I'd like to see, where the values of these small ventures are grafted onto the huge private sector. But as a countryman of Gareth Meeks, Raymond Williams once said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. That's exactly what these people are doing. Those school dinner ladies in Oldham literally created a market by forcing their suppliers to go organic and local. In Preston, they're mandating the behaviour of the private sector, even creating cooperatives. What if we were to start doing that as a state? If we were to start saying to Richard Branson or James Dyson, actually, you operate here under a social licence and protections that the rest of us give to you and we want certain things back in return, such as paying your workers a living wage, such as allowing them to join a union, such as holding to account on how much subsidy you take and how much tax you pay back. Now, none of the alternatives come with bells and whistles. That's the point. The alternatives I looked at deal with food and housing and keeping the children fed in the school holidays and grandparents busy. Because in 21st Britain, we're still dealing with 19th century problems. You probably see lots of polling about political parties and Brexit and all the rest of it. But you hardly, ever see, you hardly ever see surveys of what people actually want from an economy. Here's a rare example, done last year for the right-wing think tank, the Legatum Institute. Think of it as a collective version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And look how basic they are, food and water, emergency services, universal health care, house, a decent job, free education. Now look at what's at the bottom of the list, what they really weren't that fussed about. Owning a car, social media, Ryanair. <laughs> Think about what else is not on there. No HS2, no third runway at Heathrow, no garden bridge over the Thames. And here's what the Legatum headbangers made of that. Vehemently anti-capitalist. But I think back to Gareth Meek and all the other people I met while reporting this decade. They want security, but the politicians offer them competition. They'd like some ownership, but all they get is low interest on a plasma TV. They want control, not some know-all with solution that will fail them like all the others have done. I say, let's start from there. Let's reacquaint our economy of democracy. Let's work to make everyone's lives have meaning. Thank you. <laughs>